What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, nice like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. And this is part of the Prosper Show e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. They have an amazing conference with some of the top Amazon sellers and industry leaders including today, Robin Smith, which we'll talk about in a second. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, where entrepreneurs of six, seven, and eight-figure businesses come together live and in person every few months to solve their biggest business challenges and leave with lifelong friendships. Check out Rise25.com. Today, I'm very excited. We have Robin H. Smith, because there are a lot of probably Robin Smiths out there. He's co-founder of Virtual Logistics with Scott Beaver. The company was founded in 1994, and they help businesses take the software they use and allow them to communicate with one another so the company never has to move data manually. This obviously prevents human errors and ultimately money. And we're going to talk about a case where I think you were talking to someone earlier today where they have five people typing in things manually. Um, Virtual logistics allows e-commerce business owners to not only focus on running and growing their businesses, but to accelerate their growth. Robin, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here. So how did you decide then to start your own company? Because that's a big decision. Um, I've always been entrepreneurial. Um, I found the whole corporate structure at CN. At the time, CN had 35,000 employees. It's a big corporate bureaucracy. I found it stifling. Um, my boss would, would irritate me. I'd go to the president of the company and, and, and give him my opinion, and here's my case, and here's why. It would piss my boss off. Um, and I just knew at some point I was going to start my own business. I just didn't know what it was, but... Uh, so why did it? So at the point at that time, it started as EDI. What was the yeah, first electronic, in- electronic data interchange was where we started, which is still used in bricks and mortar retail today. So yeah, we were we were very early in the EDI. You're very day. technical. Me? No. Yeah, no. No. Um, I've got a. Yeah, you're probably gonna you're probably gonna wonder how the hell I got into it. I I did an undergrad degree in prehistoric archaeology in early May. <laughs> Um, an obvious connection there. An obvious connection. Well, actually, you know what the connection was? I was fascinated by computers. And every Saturday morning, we'd go down to the computer stores in Toronto, and we'd, you know, at the time when the Apple II came out and the early IBM computers. And I was totally fascinated by these things. And I wanted one so bad I couldn't afford it because in those days, like an Apple II was like three thousand dollars, and that was like an enormous amount of money. But that's like ten grand today. And um, I realized I realized that I wasn't I wasn't a programmer because I wasn't mathematical. But if I didn't learn how these things worked, I was never going to be able to talk to the people who. Um, who who were going to make these things work? You knew this was the future, though. It's because well, you could tell it was the you future. You could tell. Oh, you could tell. You could tell this was going to totally revolutionize. You know, even doing even doing. Um, you know, when I did my undergrad degree, we were doing computer cartography, and it was very simple stuff. But you could see the power of what was there, and even today, I mean, I look. I, I, I often say to people, I wish I was 20 years younger because the, the amount of disruption that's going on today and the amount of opportunity is, is phenomenal. Yeah. We, thought, we thought in the early years that it was going to be disruptive, and it was, but it's even more disruptive today. Yeah. Well, part of the reason you see that is because of your experience in the field, though. You know? yeah. yeah, true. true. Um, and, and you mentioned something um, in our email correspondence, and I wanted to bring this up. Um, is a futurist, uh, futuristic discussion on where retail uh, across all channels is headed. So I wanted to get your take on that. I think it's a, and you led me yeah. right into that one. Yeah. 
I think what you're seeing, what you're seeing right now is um, it's not only a, it's a shift in the way people consume. Um, part of it, there's a lot of people that are saying it's being driven by millennials and, and, and the way that they consume. But I think it's even more fundamental than that. Certainly they're, they're one of the, the characteristic cohorts that's, that's ha that, that is having the impact. But what it is, I think, is that there's an underlying technological change that is having a much, much more profound impact on how things are being delivered. And, you know, you can call it the Uberization, you can call it whatever you want, but I think that we're only just seeing the beginning of it. And what, what you've got, I mean, I think back on the first cell phone I had, it was like this giant brick that you carried around that had a, f a phone on it with a giant antenna. And, man, I thought I was so cool. I could talk for 20 minutes on this thing. <laughs> but the thing weighed 10 pounds, and after a day of carrying it around, my arm was... good workout. Yeah. yeah, it was a workout. But you think of today that we actually have a computer in, in our hands and that process of miniaturization and the applications that are running on that and the way now that we're able to serve up information, the way we're able to do things, I think that that is having a profound impact right across the board. And what that's doing in retail is that it's changing the way people consume but it's but it's 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 more fundamentally it's changing people's expectations on information. If you think of think of retailing in the eighties and nineties, you went into the store and you had a minimum wage dough head that was uh, that was on the shop. Can I help you? I mean, they weren't interested in helping you. Um, half the time, the stock wasn't there. People today, because they have so much information at their fingertips, we're going back to that nineteenth century model of, of the more boutique kind of store where you know the shop you knew the shop owner the shop owner would order stuff because he knew his clientele and i think that if you look at the way amazon now serves up information it's the same kind of idea my my grandfather had a country general store and oh, really? I remember as a kid yeah and and i can remember, he sold everything he sold screens he sold glass nails food. He was the local butcher. At one point, he even sold coffins. Um, full and, service. Yeah, it was full service. But he knew every single one of his customers that would come in. He knew if somebody wasn't from the area. Um, and what he had in his store was stuff that his consumers actually wanted to buy. That's no different than what Amazon is serving up today in being able to, to, to give you suggestions they know what you're interested in. I mean, it's just a change in the way that the technology is built. So we've gone through this process. So to come back to your question, I think what we're what we're going to see is the, the the carving out, the hollowing out of the of the middle um, general store where big box, lots of product, to those that can be sold quickly and efficiently as commodities. Um, a la Amazon or the Costco, and the high-end, very specialty retailer where you go and you have a relationship with a retailer. You know, you've, you've either got a sales rep who's been there for a long time who knows you, you've built a relationship with them, or you've got a store where you've got that kind of relationship. They sell the products that you're interested in. They're willing to do special orders for you. And I think you're going to see this commoditization on one side. I mean, it's already there with Amazon and uh, the Costco's, the the things in the middle like Sears. I mean, they're going to go by the wayside. Five years, I predict that you're going to see probably half of the existing retailers gone. You're going to see these electronic channels, and you're going to see these more specialty channels, and then you're going to have in the middle retailers this, gone like Blockbuster is gone type of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, Sears, Sears is a, Sears is on a death spiral right now. Um, you, will their online component go away too? With their retail, I don't think that. I think that that's a very very difficult process to go through to maintain that that online when your bricks and mortar dies. I think that the the 
the credibility of the brand once the bricks and mortar dies ha has such an impact on the on the on the e-commerce play that I, I my own personal opinion is I don't think it'll survive. Yeah. I mean, I think only the exceptional will survive. I think one of the ones, for example, I think that's that's really interesting and everybody should look at them is Best Buy. Look at the way Best Buy have reinvented themselves. I mean, they went from a struggling electronics retailer to a company that now is, I mean, they're pretty creative about some of the stuff that they're doing. Their marketplace in Canada, in the U.S., they shut it down because of the platform they're using. But in Canada, their marketplace is really, really successful. Um, and they've had their growing pains, but they've reinvented their stores. Their stores are now much more that destination. Um, they've gotten away from the the the, the commission based sales reps. Their guys are on salaries, you know. Um, so I think I think that I think we're going to see more of that. Um, I think you're you're also going to see much more local retailing little tiny footprints where somebody's got a shop, they're selling, um, you know, like Goulet pens, for example. I think, I think that's a good example. I mean, that's a very, very niche type of product. And you've got these specialty retailers that are niche. They're not trying to be everything for everybody. So, you know, does that answer the question? Yeah, I'm just, yeah, it does. I'm just curious of, like, if someone's has an e-commerce business now, what things should they start to look at or do differently because of what you see coming in the future? Like maybe it's not putting energy in Sears.com or whatever. What, what are some things they should be on the lookout for or start doing or stop doing because of what you see as a trend? I think the, I think the, the most important thing to me, and this is really marketing is what do they represent? You think of people, they get into business and they, they, you know, we have a very 19th century model. I buy a product from you, I mark it up and I sell it to the guy next door. I mean, that's a very 19th century, it's a traditional way of doing business. But I think that the, I think what the consumer is looking for today is much more based around, um, I want to have a relationship with you, I want authenticity from you, I want... I want knowledge. I want expertise. And I mean, if you're going to sell a commodity, that's a whole different game because that's in that model where I'm buying a product and I'm marking it up and maybe I'm providing some value add in terms of design or something or, pack, you know, neat packaging or something else, but it's still a commodity play. And really my margin is very important. But I think that what you've got on the other side is this much more experiential kind of retailing, which is, and a lot of e-commerce businesses are not commodity-based. They're much more of this experiential kind of thing. Right. And I don't think a lot of them have thought about mm -hmm. what it is that they actually represent. I'm gonna more content-type marketing, more information like he does the videos and things like that. Um, I, I'll, yeah. I'll come back to Goulet and his pens. I think, mm -hmm. I think they really nailed it because they have positioned themselves as absolute experts in the fountain pen world. Their site is fresh. They have a clean customer experience. I've never ordered from them, but I'm just going off of what their website. I, I get a sense of, of people who are inspired by what they're doing. I get a sense of people who really love fountain pens. They're not just in business because they you know, they're out there flogging pens. I mean, they're not flogging big pens by any stretch of the imagination, right. but 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 there's a you sense an enthusiasm, and I think that's one of their challenges, or one of the challenges they're going to have as they scale and get bigger is to maintain that. That's what a lot of companies don't do. Yeah, <coughs> I mean, you know, this has been hugely valuable. I really appreciate it. Um, love hearing your take on this. Everyone, I have one last question, but everyone should check out virtuallogistics.ca virtuallogistics.ca and check out what Robin and his team are doing. It's pretty cool stuff. And um, so my last question, Robin, is you said you got shot at before. Yeah. yeah. It was in 1994, late 94. Um, one of my last uh, business trips I did with Canac 
I was uh, I was in Ethiopia in Addis Ababa, and I was uh, sitting on the balcony of of the Sheraton Hotel overlooking the the hills, having a pizza and a glass of wine. Um, I just come from a business trip um, out of out of East Africa, and I was on my way to Saudi Arabia, and this gunfight broke out in the back backyard of the the uh, the hotel, like it was in the the property right behind the hotel, and the bullets were flying like all over the place, and um, of course the pizza went flying, the glass of wine ended up in the parking lot, and I ended up on the ground. <laughs> It's not a story I tell very often, but yeah, that that was that's pretty uh, crazy. That was my experience with Addis. <laughs> well, I want to be the first one to thank you, Robin. This has been hugely valuable. People should check out virtuallogistics.ca, and uh, I look forward to seeing you in person. Thank you very much, right. Jeremy, and uh, we will uh, see you in Vegas at yeah. uh, Prosper Show. And anybody listening, uh, we we will be there. So uh, happy to chat. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.